Thanks, Sam. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's um, Connecting with Nature seminar by MPA. Um, really looking forward to tonight's seminar, which is by Mick Roderick from BirdLife Australia. Um, but before I pass over to Mick, just a couple of things. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that we're all meeting variously on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And then just a couple of little bits of housekeeping. For those of you who are new to the format of these Zoom webinars, you can't ask questions directly to the speaker, but what you can do is um, actually use the, uh, what's referred to as the Q&A function down on the bottom bar. And if you just hover your cursor over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see right-hand side, it just says Q&A. If you write any questions in there, I'll make sure that they're asked at the end of the seminar. Um, so you'll get the chance to sort of, um, yeah, if there's anything you want to follow up with Mick. Also, if you have any just general comments that you'd like to make as we're, you like to share with others on the seminar as we go through, just use the chat function, which is over on the, a little bit more to the, to the left. Um, so tonight Mick's going to be talking about Regent Honey Eaters and I've got to say I'm really looking forward to this because it's you know in the in the whole spectrum of conservation management particularly threatened species management you know we've got species that are restricted to particular areas and it's not to say it's not challenging having to deal with places that, that species that have very specific requirements but at least you're focused in on that population, you're focused in on the habitats within a particular area. That all gets so much more complex and challenging once you're dealing with animals that um, operate across vast distances and you've got to be able to provide for all the critical stages in their lives across those vast distances. And, um, you know, one of the poster, child, poster children for that sort of lifestyle in Australia is definitely the Regent Honey Eater. So, um, Mick, really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say, and um, I'm, I'm hoping that there is a thread of hope in this. So, <laughs> uh, over to you. Excellent. Thanks, Gary, and thanks, Sam, um, for the invitation to talk to you guys tonight about Regent Honey Eaters, which I like to refer to as the jewel of the temperate woodlands. And Gary made a good point there that uh, you know, often some of these threatened species are quite range restricted, but with the Regent Honey Eater, its decline and you know, almost near disappearance as uh, it's symptomatic of the loss of a, a type of habitat, which is our temperate woodlands in southeastern Australia. So these temperate woodlands are actually incredibly diverse. Uh, 250 to 300 species of birds actually use these woodlands. Uh, but the important point is that many of them only use these woodlands and they do not use other uh, habitat types, and we refer to these as obligate woodland birds. They're actually one of the most diverse habitats in, in, in Southern Australia. Rainforest, yes, they're very diverse, but our temperate woodlands are also ex extremely um, diverse. So I just wanted to start um, by painting a picture uh, about the habitat for Regent honey eaters and what we refer to as woodlands versus forests. So not all forests actually will function as habitat for woodland birds. Not all forests are woodlands. Uh, woodlands are, are generally a more sparse and, and dry type of, of vegetation. What we've got there on the screen is a classic example of, of a, a beautiful uh, dry temperate woodland, plenty of fallen timber, um, scattered trees. So if you look at aerial photos or if you're flying into Sydney airport, you look out the window, you do see a lot of bush. There is actually still quite a lot of bush uh, uh, along the along on the east coast of Australia, but the point is that a lot of that that bush is along the spur of the Great Dividing Range, or it's wet forests um, in, in in mountainous areas. These aren't the sorts of of, of habitats that that we talk about when we when we think about temperate woodlands. This is the sort of stuff we're talking about, basically on on flat land, quite open, sparse canopies, um, and mistletoe and fallen timber. The sorts of basically the sorts of habitat that we've, we've essentially lost. Uh, and if you look at that map there on, on, on the right, so what that is showing is uh, the, the red is basically they were once uh, temperate woodlands or, or forested areas that are, are now lost. And so we're, we're in a situation where we have essentially lost 
about 85% of our temperate woodlands in southeastern Australia. Uh, but not only that, of the 15% that's left, uh, most of that is highly fragmented, so it doesn't actually serve as habitat for threatened and declining woodland birds. So the, the pinups uh, of the, the woodland birds, the, the most threatened, I guess, uh, are these two birds on the screen now, the swift parrot and the regent honey eater. And these are the two species that BirdLife Australia's Woodland Birds Program focuses um, the most on. Swift parrots are down to about 750 individuals. Uh, regents, uh, about a third of that. Uh, the most recent population estimates put the bird somewhere between 250 to 350 individuals. The 350 is perhaps optimistic. Both of these birds are critically endangered, uh, which is the last rung on the ladder before extinct in the wild. And there's a beautiful shot uh, taken by the recovery coordinator, Dean Ingwersen, of a, of a regent honey eater in, in the Kapiti Valley. So regent honey eaters, they rely on flowering eucalypts and they tend to go for the, the trees that provide the most or the highest yields of nectar. They're quite fussy. They have their favourites. Uh, similar in a way to how koalas, they don't eat the leaves of, of any old gum trees. They have their favourites. Regent honey eaters also have, have their favourite trees to, to feed on. And these include mugger ironbark, white box and yellow box, which are generally on the western slopes, spotted gums and swamp mahogany and broadleaf ironbarks, which are in, in the coastal watersheds. They will go for blossom on other eucalypts, such as stringy barks, and they're very fond of mistletoes, which I'll expand on a bit later. So these are the sorts of habitats where you'll find uh, Regent honey, it is some beautiful uh, mugger ironbark in the box ironbark woodlands, plenty of mistletoe in, in that forest. Um, there's a, a close up of a bird feeding in mugger ironbark uh, blossom. Uh, mugger ironbark is a fantastic tree, amazing, amazing habitat tree. Uh, grassy white box woodlands are an, another uh, favoured habitat type. Again, habitat type that's largely been lost. The grassy white box woodland itself is a critically endangered vegetation community. Um, and yeah, I guess it's it's often the trees that produce the, the, the most tasty honey, you know, the white box and the yellow box. So these are the sorts of trees that, that Regent Honey is honing in on. And there's some images of a, of, of a yellow box tree. So these, these are the trees that are generally more sort of in the inland part of their range. Closer to the coast, uh, the, the Regent's uh, honing in on the spotted gum ironbark forests. Um, particularly in places like the, the Lower Hunter Valley. <clears throat> and the spotted gum is the main uh, feed tree in, in that environment, uh, which is a winter flowering tree. So quite often that's where Regent honey eaters will turn up in, in winter. Uh, as we speak, we do have a small number of, of Regents feeding in spotted gum in the, in the Lower Hunter Valley. Uh, and uh, not that long ago, it doesn't happen often these days because the, the, the bird is in such small numbers, but there was a time when the swamp mahogany forests of uh, uh, the, the coastal environments uh, were supporting large numbers of regent honey eaters, again, in the, in the winter time, because swamp mahogany actually is a, is a purely a winter flowering tree. The birds don't breed in this sort of environment. This is a, a, a wintering habitat. Uh, a very important habitat type for regent honey eaters are the river she oak forests. And those are generally in, on the western slopes or in the, in the drier coastal catchments, such as the Kapiti Valley or the Upper Hunter Valley. Uh, and in this environment, it's not actually the she oaks themselves that the birds are, are arriving to feed on. It's the noodle leaf mistletoe that occurs in the uh, river oak forests. And mistletoes are an extremely important plant for, for regent honey eaters. Uh, they also feed on, on box mistletoe. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor there, but there's a regent honey eater feeding in the box uh, mistletoe blossom there on, on the left. Uh, and uh, one of the most important uh, mistletoes in, in particular in contemporary times is the long flowered mistletoe. So the long flowered mistletoe occurs uh, in mostly sort of coastal areas, but it, it occurs in, in the spotted gums. Uh, so it's, a, it's in an environment where, where birds are spending a winter. And if the mistletoe flowers into spring, particularly when the broadleaf ironbarks are also flowering, the birds may persist and breed. And you can see 
a beautiful photo there of a regent honeyeater sitting in a nest that's that's built uh, in a long flowered mistletoe. So they've got their food source where they've got their nest. Regent honeyeaters will also feed on 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 lerp, uh, uh, which is a sugary exudate, sort of like a like a sugary umbrella that leaf insects build over themselves, uh, which is uh, full of protein. And, and Regent honeyeaters and many other Australian honeyeaters and even swift parrots, uh, pardalotes, things like that, they love feeding on lerp. Lerp is a very important part of the Australian environment for uh, as, as a food source for, for birds. And they will occasionally feed on um, other things such as calistamins. And there's an image there of a bird feeding in a, in a plant of grevillea. But that's, 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 that doesn't happen um, that often. So the birds are uh, uh, a spring breeder, basically. They uh, will breed mostly from August to, to January, but their peak breeding is, is pretty much from September through to late November. Um, the nest is made from mostly bark and collected stringy bark that is woven together with uh, spider's web um, and lined with, with grass and, and perhaps uh, things like wool. Uh, and that's usually done in, in high in the, the fork of a tree or in a, in a clump of mistletoe, as we saw before, and two or often three uh, eggs are, are laid. So as I said before, this, uh, this is now an extremely rare bird and the, the decline of Regent honey, it is even though it was picked up as being uh, threatened you know, in, in the last 50 years, the, the decline in the last 20 years has been catastrophic to some extent. Uh, around about 250 to 300 birds um, is a, a very low population for a bird that has a, a pretty pretty large range. And as I said earlier, it is critically endangered uh, across the board. So the Regent honey, it is um, as recently as 1980, this was the range pretty much from Adelaide up to about the Sunshine Coast. And they were occupying a large, a large part of that range. Uh, fast forward to the 2000s, the bird has disappeared from South Australia. Uh, it's also disappeared from, from Western Victoria. I mean, that, to be fair, that map there is probably a bit, uh, a bit, a, a bit generous. Um, the birds really are, are in Victoria are, are mostly restricted to the, the northeast um, corner. Uh, and in Queensland, there's there's, there's evidence of, of, of recent breeding, but we get very few reports in Queensland. Uh, by far and away, New South Wales is the stronghold of the Regent Honeyeater. Uh, and this graph here shows uh, data that's been collected pretty much from when we noticed that this, this sharp decline was happening. And then in, in the mid nineties, there was an effort made to, to get people out and about uh, doing surveys and, and, and counting Regent Honeyeaters. Uh, and as recently as, as, as 95, there was, you know, over 1,400 Regent honeyeaters were accounted for. Um, so there would have been many more birds unaccounted for. And when you look at what, what's happening in that graph, um, it's quite sad that on average, we're only getting you know, at best about 100 birds reported to us um, each year. So. This is a this is a species that has has declined very rapidly in in, in a very worrying way. Uh, so the number of birds is shown by by the blue the blue polygons, whereas the the number of sites uh, is represented by, by the crimson there. And you can see back in '95 that the birds were reported from over 200 different places. And so essentially the number of sites the birds were reported from back then is pretty much now the pop population of the bird. Um, we're only getting reports from around 30, 35 different locations each year. And the sad thing is uh, that quite often, the majority of those 30 or 40 places that birds are reported, it's only one bird uh, at, at that site, which you know, really doesn't mean a great deal. It's, um, yeah, it's quite unfortunate. So why have Regent honeyers declined so much? Well, the short answer is we don't, actually know exactly why, but as is the case with just about every threatened species, the loss of habitat has been the, the key driver. So there's no doubt that habitat loss, the loss of our temperate woodlands, you know, we've lost 85% of it, that has been the key driver. But at the same time that the region honey eater has lost that proportion of its habitat, other birds that use these areas have also lost a similar amount of habitat, but they have not declined 
as much as Regent honey eaters. So there is something about Regents that we still don't quite understand uh, why they have almost fallen off their perch. Um, I tend to think that it's it's their lifestyle choice because they are uh, quite fussy about about what they eat. They they're always looking for the for the best patches of, of habitat, always looking for the richest uh, nectar producing trees. Um, they're very mobile as as a result, and so if you're living a lifestyle where you're constantly on the move, and a lot of your habitat has disappeared, it's, it's a very high risk lifestyle. So. The, the most critical contemporary threat really to this bird is the critically low population. The fact that there's only at best 300, 350 birds left is the biggest threat to the bird. Uh, and that's because, uh, I mean, this was a bird that, that actually used to occur in, in large flocks that many honey eaters, um, Australian honey eaters actually will arrive at a, at a, a blossom event in numbers and there'll be this sort of carry on, you know, trying to get at the resource and then be bossing each other around. Because there's so few regent honey eaters, they really just don't, don't stand a chance. And so it, the, the lack of flocks and, and um, the, the fact that more often than not, when we actually find a pair of regent honey eaters nesting, they're on their own and they're completely susceptible uh, to um, competition to la from larger honey eaters such as wattle birds and fry birds, um, but also um, pr pr um, predation from avian and, and mammalian predators. So things like arawongs, ravens, kookaburras, um, you can see there's a photo there of, an, of a noisy miner raiding a, um, a, a nest. It was actually a fake nest, but um, part of an experiment. And on the, on the left there is an image of a, a, a sugar glider um, um, taking the there's actually an adult female incubating that nest and the glider takes the eggs and the bird just, just flies off, but sometimes the bird isn't able to fly off. Um, and of course, um, people may have seen uh, in the media that the, you know, the Regent honey eater has almost become famous for uh, being the bird that has lost its love song. So there's been recent research done on, to, on the fact that Regent honey eaters, lone male birds uh, are being found in parts of their range, singing the calls of other birds, other honey eaters. And the theory is that that could be that because there are so few birds, these lone males are wandering the landscape and they're not associating with other regent honey eaters because the, the popula population is so small and they're learning the, the songs of other, of other birds. It's quite sad. So the key breeding locations in the last 15 years uh, have been from northeast Victoria up to the northern rivers in New South Wales. But in the last five, six years, it's really been those middle fours, which are all around the, the, the edge of the, the Greater Blue Mountains. So the upper and lower Hunter Valleys, the Cape Valley, Valley and, and, and the Baragarong Valley. All of these sites are kind of around the edge of the, the, the sandstone country. And that's really where it's at these days for, for, for Regent honey eaters. So there's been a recovery team for Regents since 1994. Um, and the most recent uh, recovery plan um, was in April 2016. That's actually being reviewed as we speak. So there will be a new recovery plan uh, for the Regent honey eater um, soon. And that's the recipe for recovery for the bird outlining all the actions we, we need to take. Um, to, to help get this bird and steer it away from extinction. Um, so Ross Crates did a PhD uh, and on Regents and his fieldwork found that uh, nest success uh, is at an all time low. So even though he was finding nests, like the, the juvenile, or the, the, the productivity of these nests were, was way down from when Damon Oliver did his PhD in, in the 90s. Um, and he also found that there's a, an alarming um, adult sex ratio um, bias. Um, there's double the amount of males um, to females in the population. So as a result, we get these lone males and, and, and often when we get birds reported to us or if we're doing our field work and we find, we often find a lone regent honey eater that's singing his heart out, but he's, he's calling to no one because there are actually fewer females in the population. So earlier this year, the 
Australian National University took a lot of the data that we have on, on Regent honey eaters and they did what we call a population viability analysis, a PVA. So what that PVA sets out to do is basically take all the data, all the information that we can find on Regent honey eaters, including zoo birds, which I will talk about soon, um, put it through the sausage machine of, of data crunching and out the other end comes, comes out what we need to do to save this bird. They basically concluded that if we did nothing, the bird would be extinct within 10 years. Uh, so it's, it's, it's that critical that we need to actually take these actions. Um, but the two most important things, apart from the obvious one being protecting the breeding habitat, uh, was to increase the nest pro um, productivity. So making sure that the few birds that are out there uh, building nests and incubating eggs can actually successfully breed, uh, trying to protect them from things like parawongs and, um, and gliders. And the other thing is to supplement the wild population of regents with zoo bred birds. And we need to release around about 100 birds every two years to actually try and get the regents back onto a, a, a more bright future. Um, so with the nest protection, this is actually a very contemporary thing because um, the recovery team are discussing this at the moment. In fact, we have an all day workshop pardon me, happening Friday this week where we're going to be going through, we've, we've engaged a decision-making scientist to, to listen to us as the experts on Regent Honey Eaters and all the different things that we think we can do um, to try and stop nest predators from taking eggs and, and killing birds. Uh, so far, it's really been limited to putting trunk guards around, around trees to try and prevent possums getting up the trees. There, there isn't a great deal that we've been able to do to try and stop things like parawongs and kookaburras um, getting at nests. Now, I don't want to speculate what, what that might look like, um, but by, uh, by the time that uh, this workshop happens and the report comes out in, in a few months' time, we'll have a better idea on how we can protect nests um, from, from bird predators. Um, so these, these photos here show some some more trunk guards. And we also put up cameras on nests um, to actually see what goes on. And I'm pretty sure that, that that nest there on the right hand side, which was in the Capiti Valley, I think that nest was eventually um, predated by a, a brush tail possum. Uh, so this is a current priority for, for the recovery team. Um, one of the other things um, that we do is remove um, noisy miners. And that image there is taken um, in the Tamalpan woodlands where we actually remove noisy miners from a region only a breeding site. Uh, it's an extreme measure, but if we are actually going to save this bird, um, this is the sort of stuff that, that we need to do. We need to facilitate the breeding of the Regent honey eater, because if they can't breed, then there's no point even thinking about the recovery of the bird. They have to, they have to keep churning out juveniles in, into the population. Uh, whilst we're doing the captive releases as well. So just talking about the, the captive releases. Uh, so there are two reasons why we have a captive population um, of regent honey eaters. The first one is the classic, you know, if the bird goes extinct in the wild, at least we've got a, a captive population. So it's like an insurance population, I guess. We hope that that, you know, that will never happen. The other reason that we have a captive population is to supplement the wild population with, with zoo bred birds and Taronga Zoo spearhead um, the recovery effort in terms of, of captive releases of birds. And there's been, you know, until a couple of years ago, um, this mostly happened in um, Taronga in, in Sydney, but there's some new aviaries now out, out at Taronga Western Plains um, in Dubbo, which is fantastic. Uh, there's a couple of, of, of birds out of the Dubbo facility there. So to date, most of the releases have happened in Chilton. Um, there was a bit, uh, a very small release in 2000. It was very experimental, really, of nine birds. But subsequent to that, the, the larger scale releases have all happened in Chilton in Victoria. The theory there was that we would be supplementing the range uh, or supplementing the population of the bird at the, at the edge of its range. Um, the recovery team then decided rather than doing that, we would actually release birds in the core of their range in New South Wales. So 
There's been two releases in the Lower Hunter Valley, uh, one in 2020, which was only 20 birds. That was a very small release. It wasn't very successful. But last year, we did a release of 58 birds um, into the Tamarpa Woodlands, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. So in Chilton, uh, we've had great success. Um, we've shown that birds can survive. And we've had captive birds actually pair with wild birds and they have produced young. And captive birds have actually paired in the wild and produced young as well. So it's, 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 it's fantastic to know that it can work. Um, you know, you, you really are playing God when, when you're doing stuff like this. Uh, so in 2020, I mentioned we did a small release of, of only 20 birds um, that were monitored for three months. And, Unfortunately, we did lose eight out of those, those 20 birds. And we seem to think that it was because the, the habitat was a bit more fragmented than Chilton uh, and the Tamalpan Woodlands, which is where we did last year's release. So last year's release was the largest release of Regent honey it is we've done in New South Wales. Uh, 58 birds uh, released in the Tamalpan Woodlands, which is an area where there's been significant breeding events uh, in recent years. And it was done on Wanarua country and on land owned by the Mind River Aboriginal Land Council. And that image bottom left is uh, the smoking ceremony that happened at the first of the two releases, which were only a few days apart. Uh, and on the right of um, that image is Uncle Richard Edwards, who was a Wanarua elder that, that welcomed uh, the birds and us um, back to Wanarua country in Wanarua language. Um, so it's been a fantastic partnership working with, with the, the Land Council and the Wana rural people. And as I mentioned before about the, the, the concept of the Regent honey eater losing its song, um, at the very same time, the Wana rural language is being reawakened um, by, by, by um, researchers. So there's this amazing parallel between the story of the Regent honey eater losing its song and the Wanarua people almost losing the, their language. And so when we converge to do conservation work on um, Aboriginal land, it's this merging of cultural and ecological goals. It's been, it's been an incredible journey, to be honest. And yeah, we, we've had a, quite a bit of uh, media attention around it and we managed to get uh, about, about a five minute slot on, on the project. Uh, so people can just Google Regent Honey of the project and there's a a good piece um, there and Farah Deva, who's the, the CEO of Mid River Land Council, spoke about the, the struggles of Aboriginal people and it's so relevant to the struggles of the region honey eaters. So yeah, working together um, has been yeah, an incredible experience. And this release was very successful. So in Chilton, uh, so you can see the 2020 release there, we lost 40% of our birds, but uh, in, in, in Chilton, there's generally been around about 15%, maybe a bit higher mortality. Last year, we only know of two birds that died out of, out of 58, so it's been by far um, the lowest confirmed mortality of any release we've done. Uh, and that's me sort of uh, radio tracking uh, from a high point. So the way that we can actually follow these birds, um, we don't necessarily rely on just finding them each day. We actually fit uh, radio transmitters to, to a proportion of the birds. Last year, it was, it was half of them. Um, when you get yourself to a, a high point, you can actually get signals um, from a good number of birds. When you're below the canopy, it can be harder to pick up a, a signal. Uh, but that's a good image there showing the, the Tamalpan woodlands, this wonderful patch of spotted gum ironbark forest on, on flat ground. Um, that's, that's a vertically exaggerated uh, uh, image of the Tamalpan woodlands. Those, those yellow dots are, are previous records of wild regent honey eaters, and um, these are the woodlands where we where we released uh, the, the regents. And in 2018, it was the only place that that regent honey eaters bred. It's such an important area. Uh, and this 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 aerial photo here just shows some of the monitoring data. Um, there were a couple of um, birds that were adventurous that that went out and actually some reason they turned up in um, a rehabilitated mine site feeding on flowering trees out there. A few other birds sort of ventured around, but generally speaking, the birds didn't leave the Tamalpan woodlands. Um, they knew they were in a great patch of habitat and birds were pairing. Well, we actually think birds were pairing in the tents because 
Karonga very cleverly separated the boys from the girls uh, a couple of months before the release. And so by the time they came back together at the release site, uh, you know, the theory was it's springtime. It was the first time we'd done a spring release of birds. And so we just were hoping that nature would take its course. And that's certainly what happened because we had nests being built within a few days of birds um, being let out of the tent. Uh, even though we did have a lot of a lot of nests, so we had anything up to 50 nests constructed. Uh, these are naive birds and there's a lot of challenges. Uh, even for wild birds, there's a lot of challenges in, in raising young. Um, and so as a result, the vast majority of those nests were unsuccessful, but we, we do know of at least one uh, zoo bred fledging. So this was a pair of zoo bred birds that, that raised, um, raised a chick, a very, very precious precious chick, this one. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, so that's the offspring of uh, red metal orange, orange white. So orange white is the male bird and that's, that's him feeding our precious chick. Uh, I'm just seeing if we've got um, time. I'll just play this, this video. This is the, the chick being fed. This is wonderful footage by Lockie Hall. That's a very young bird. This bird was actually on the ground and he managed to climb back up into this, this acacia. This is, this sorry, was Mick, actually, yeah. sorry, Mick, just interrupt. We don't have the audio coming through. Oh, okay. I, I, I'm just looking at the time. I might just flick through anyway. Um, so, the highlights from last year's release was, it, like I said, it was the first one that was done during the breeding season. Uh, and like I said, birds were essentially pairing up in, in the tents. Uh, and we had the first nest constructed on day eight. Uh, but the thing is, apart from the fact that we did a release there, there were a whole bunch of wild birds. And we had a number of uh, wild pairs breeding in the woodlands at the same time that we, we were doing the release. Uh, uh, wild pairs face their challenges as well and what that photo there shows uh, so we found a wild pair nest uh, on the day of the second release and we went back the next day and here was this poor chick just flapping around on the ground what we thought had happened and there was no, there was nothing left in the nest so what we thought had happened was that a karawong or something had come in taken one of the chicks and the other chick had fallen out of the nest um, so fortunately Taronga actually took that chick and that chick has now gone down to Taronga Zoo. It couldn't be released back into the wild. So it's contributed to the captive population. Um, and there's dad bringing in food for, for his young bird. He didn't, didn't know what was going on. It's just, yeah, pretty sad what some of the things you, you see with, with Regent Honey it is. So some of the other recovery actions that we do, uh, we do a lot of private land conservation. So we do a thing called covenanting. So, um, about two thirds of all Regent Honey records in the last 20 odd years have been on private properties. And so achieving uh, conservation outcomes on private properties is a very important part of the work that we do. Um, that's a photo there taken on a, a covenant and property in the Cape Eden Valley. Of course, habitat restoration, trying to restore some of the, the, the immense amount of habitat that's been lost um, for the Regent Honey Eater is another a major action. This is a, in a place called Low Hills um, in Victoria, pretty large scale um, habitat restoration. Uh, and I'm going to talk now about mistletoe because mistletoe has been a very important plant for the Regent Honey Eater. And here's a couple of photos of little lorikeets, which you'd normally associate with eucalypt blossom um, getting stuck into the mistletoe blossom. Uh, and so these these are three photos of um, a regents that I think I've, I've shown before feeding on the mistletoe. And so this is a, a, a key breeding habitat for Regent honey eaters. I was chatting to Gary before the meeting started, started about just how important these, um, these river oak forests are and the needle leaf mistletoe that, that feed the adult birds when they, when they build the nest and, and, and feed the young. So in places like the Capity Valley, that's the sort of habitat that, that they breed in. And of course, the long flowered mistletoe is vitally important. So the long flowered mistletoe and, and and where birds breed um, in that habitat is essentially restricted to one place, which is the Tamalpan woodlands. 
Uh, and even though the Tamapa woodlands, are, <laughs> a lot of the area are uh, zoned for industrial development, the hunter economic zone, um, severe fires are actually a major threat to these forests. And what this image here shows uh, the, the polygons for the, for the fires that have gone through um, these forests. And these, these fires have been highly intense fires that have burnt the canopy. And so when the canopy um, is burnt and scorched, you lose the, the mistletoe. And there's a, a photo there of, a, of a, a female incubating on a, um, in a mistletoe. So what we decided to do was we didn't have time to wait for the net because I'm um, not sure if I mentioned, but mistletoe is killed outright by fire. It doesn't really sprout after fire like other Australian plants do. So we've embarked on a pretty ambitious project uh, to essentially tag in for the, the job that the mistletoe bird does and other birds that eat the mistletoe seeds and spread it around the forest. Uh, we figured that we didn't have time to wait for the birds to do that. We would actually get ahead of the game collect the seeds and plant the mistletoe ourselves. And that's what the, the fruits of the, mistletoe, the long flowered mistletoe look like when they're ready for picking. And so far we've planted about 2000 uh, mistletoe seeds into the forest. Uh, this photo here, uh, if you can see that, that dark object there, that's one of our arborists right at the top of a spot of gum tree. So even though we could potentially collect seeds and then just walk around and you know, wipe them on low branches, that's not quite the point. We need to get the seeds into the canopy because that's, that's the, the places where the regent honey is will actually use the, the um, restored mistletoe. And again, this is a project that we've, um, we're partnering with Minda River Land Council on. Uh, it's not just fires that claim mistletoe. Uh, they don't survive drought very well. And this is, these photos are taken in the Capity Valley which was at one point in time, the nursery ground for Regent honey eaters. And during the recent drought, we noticed that just about every clump of mistletoe died along the Capity River. So again, we've um, getting proactive, collecting seeds, employing arborists and, and planting seeds up, up into the trees. Noisy miners, as I, I mentioned before, these, the, there is no doubt the science is in. I know there was some discussion when Candace gave her talk about the conservation action plan for woodland birds that noisy miners get a bad reputation. And I admit it is not the noisy miners fault. We have created the perfect environment for these birds to flush, but they are a problem for, for regent honey eaters because they are actually intersecting with each other, whereas they wouldn't have in the past because we've created so many edge effects and we've, we've reduced the understory vegetation in places where regent honey eaters are still trying to breed. Uh, and the, the incidence of noisy miners or the impact on, on threatened woodland birds has been listed as a key threatening process under state and federal legislation. Uh, what do we do? It's very difficult, um, but what we have been doing, and BirdLife and ANU have been doing this for some years now, we are, we are licensed to actually remove noisy miners from Regent Honey at a um, breeding site. And that happens both uh, before the breeding season and sometimes during a breeding season. So this map here shows an area where Ross found a bunch of Regent honey at a nest in 2017. There were a lot of noisy miners. Uh, he gave us a call, we sent someone out um, who removed the miners and that turned out to be the most, the most successful site for, for Regent honey at a breeding that season. That photo was, 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 was taken at that site. Uh, another exciting thing that's happened recently has been the ability to place satellite transmitters on, on regents. So when we track our zoo bred released birds, we use radio tracking, radio tracking technology, which is, which is fine, but you, you've limited to, a, you, you can only be um, up to I don't know, a few kilometers from the bird. Whereas using satellite tracking technology, we can, um, in theory, uh, follow birds that are hundreds of, of, of kilometers away from from us, and in fact, we can we can monitor these birds from our laptops, and so the technology has only just reached the point where we can uh, we can get uh, a satellite transmitter that is small enough to deploy onto a, a bird the size of a regent honey. A regent honey, a, a large regent honey at a male is about forty eight grams, something like that. So we we still need a large male bird to put one of these on, uh, but it's very exciting the fact that we can we can do this and uh, at, as part of the release, because we had wild birds and zoo birds still 
in the Tamalpa woodlands. Uh, we set up some mist nets and we were able to catch a few, a few birds. We, we caught wild and zoobred birds. Unfortunately, the wild birds that we caught, none of them were heavy enough to take a satellite transmitter, but we did actually catch three male birds um, that were heavy enough to, to carry one. And so we have now fitted three birds with satellite transmitters. Unfortunately, uh, because this is, this is really pioneering work, as far as we're aware, um, nobody's attempted this with a bush bird before. These, this is the sort of technology that has mostly been used on larger birds, seabirds, waterbirds, shorebirds. Uh, so we have had some data, um, particularly from one bird, but unfortunately two out of the other three birds we're, we've had a few teething problems with. But, you know, this is, all, this is stuff that we, we, we need to um, perfect as we, as we head off into the future. And there's, there's Dean Ingleston, I mentioned before, the recovery coordinator, um, looking very happy because it, it was a long road to get to this um, to this point. So how can you help Regent Honey Eaters? So I'm just going to finish off really with just some quick tips on, on how to recognise and find the birds. Um, really, finding Regents for us is, is such an important thing because there are so few birds out there and so few of us that do the monitoring. We really need people to report birds to us. Um, how to recognise them? So uh, they're a medium-sized honey eater, um, beautiful dark head, wonderful uh, yellow um, tail, and this amazing chainmail contrasting black and, and yellow breast. Uh, similar in size to a, a striped honey eater, a bit smaller than a noisy miner, a little bit bigger than your classic small honey eaters such as yellow face, et cetera. Um, there's a size comparison there. So they're bigger than those sort of New Holland honey eater size bird. Um, we do have identif identification guides available online, so I won't spend too much time tonight just being mindful of, of time. All of this stuff is available on our website and uh, we have woodland bird identification uh, booklets as well. So when I tell people, if you want to set off, go looking for Regent Honey Eaters, the first thing you do is you go to the right habitat. There's no point going uh, to a rainforest or a mudflat. You've got to go to your temperate woodland, which has white box yellow box, any of those trees that I mentioned before. Look for flowering trees. Um, and one of the, one of the tips uh, I give people is to listen, listen out for birds that also occur at, at big blossom events, such as little lorikeets, noisy fry birds. These are, these are similar birds to regions in that, that they follow these amazing blossom events. So where you get lots of um, little lorikeets and noisy fry birds arrive at a site, that's where you might get some regions turn up. Uh, and then often uh, what I do is I sort of work out the demographic of a tree. If I find a tree that's flowering, I work out what is happening in that tree because it's usually the larger birds that are trying to dominate the, the canopy and they'll be chasing the smaller birds around. So as you're watching the larger birds chasing the smaller birds, keep your eye out for a medium sized bird. You, know, you, might, you might get a flash of black and yellow. Uh, so you kind of, you get to know what's happening um, within a flowering tree um, and they are very fond of coming down to water uh, and so as with any bush bird it's very important to learn the call uh, i will attempt this is one of my last slides so sam step in if you can't hear that can you guys hear that the sound did come through are you able to up the volume at all and play it again okay i'll So this, so the call of the Regent Honey Eater, uh, I call it like a soft chuckle. It doesn't carry a long way, uh, but in the call I'm going to play, you can hear a couple of sort of chat chat. That's that's they're doing a bill clapping, and the bill clapping can be can be heard from quite a distance. So that that call is available on our website and it's embedded as a link into our ID booklet. So I recommend if you are looking for Regent Honey is learn the call because that, that is how you will pick them up. Um, and if you think it's worthwhile, you can actually play some calls yourself, which is what we do. But don't do that if you suspect that they might be greedy. So yeah, that's that's the talk. Uh, thanks for, for listening and I'm, I'm happy to field any, any questions on my favourite subject.
Thanks, Mick. That was, um, it's actually hard to frame questions when you get such a thorough presentation, <laughs> but um, but we'll give it a crack. We've got a few. And um, uh, I did say at the start that I was hoping it would be a hopeful um, uh, situation. It is pretty confronting thinking that, yeah. you know, we're in the same situation as the folk that saw the last dodos or great orcs. Like it's, you know, it's... yeah. The extinction crisis is real and um you know this is it's, it's quite bizarre to think that you've seen something in some abundance at one point of your life but it becomes extinct uh yeah a few years later so anyway that's the sound note um look i i always <laughs> i always take um advantage of the sort of prerogative of the mc to ask the first sort of question at least and one of the things that struck me was you showed that graph of the decline from um, uh, the mid '90s onwards. It looked as though, even though like it had a um, consistent curve, there was something mm. happened around the 2005, 2006 point. Yeah, yeah. I guess that sort of raises two questions. One is, is there something that happened then? Like, you know, is that the back of the big 2003 drought? Um, and is the fact that that in fact the levels have stayed relatively stable since that 2005 because of the introductions that have happened or yeah what, what's going on that yeah. um it's been you know you've actually had 15 years of relatively um consistent data yeah for... yeah, yeah. Uh, i mean admittedly there, there might be a little bit of noise in that in that early data because the, the way the data was collected back then is a bit different now um, there may not have been 1,400 regions, but there were certainly many hundreds. Like, you know, David Gehring, was, he, he banded over 100 birds in a day or something, you know, which is ridiculous. So, yeah, the decline is definitely real. Um, yes, I, I do think the millennium drought did really knock this bird around. Yes, maybe around about that time they were kind of teetering, and then what that drought did was it, it just it, it affected their ability to, to, to breed. And so... There was a number of poor years in a, in, a, in a row, and although you know Australia is is built on a boom bust environment, when you get to a, a low population, and even you know even if there was a thousand birds, that's still a very low population. And for a bird that is very mobile, very fussy, you know if if they have a series of poor seasons consecutively, which is what happened in in those years preceding two thousand and five, and even be, even beyond. Yeah, that, that's that's probably what happened. It, it, it was the inability to actually breed and supplement the the population. The that so that graph. I should clarify that um, we do not actually count a released bird as a wild bird until twelve months after release. Okay. Yeah, and that then that doesn't actually happen that often. I mean, you know, there's there's still zebra birds wandering around, but they don't actually get found. And reported that often because you know people see regions but you've probably got to have a, a very keen eye or a good camera to be able to pick up the color bands on a bird that we can actually say oh that bird was released in such and such so there probably aren't that many zoo bred birds in in that in that data yeah okay um i might jump to bernadette's question because it is relevant to this sort of issue of the population structure and that was well, what sort of age do regents live to are they a long-lived species or no generally eight nine years in in, in obviously in captivity they, they live longer but in in the wild uh i think the longest sort of band recovery might be six years or something but yeah 10 10 years would be probably the the, the absolute absolute maximum and they can they can breed the, the females can breed in in their first year in fact I've, I've seen this a few times locally that an adult male is paired with a, a first year female and then they've been able to successfully breed so at least they can you know, they can procreate at, at an early age yeah but it doesn't sound like this is a species that can use longevity to get through bad no, years no that's exactly right yeah and i mean you know to be fair that's probably the same for a lot of Australia's bush birds, but yeah, they those other birds, yeah, they don't they don't have that high risk lifestyle that regions have. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Paul has asked whether this is a species that might be affected by the Warragamba ball uh, Warragamba wall raising. 
100 percent yes <laughs> so i did i did show on that on that image um that outlined the key breeding sites the the warragamba well i should i should say the Baragarang valley uh has been demonstrated as being one of the four or five top breeding sites for the bird uh and where ross crates was monitoring birds in 2017 uh he had a number of nests that would go under so the habitat that he was monitoring these birds would be underwater basically you know in in that 11 meter raising or 15 meter whatever it is at now so very much the the raising of the warragamba dam would be a disaster for regent honey and uh you know in in all the, you know there's a number of reasons why a lot of people don't think that that should go ahead but as far as uh endangered birds are concerned the region is kind of at, at the head of the head of the pack really yeah yeah um questions from nigel and karen which are really about the sort of the small population size so and, and part of it is you know is there anything other than a stochastic sort of issue with the skew towards male birds is there is there something that's sort of driving the population towards the um being skewed towards male and from nigel about whether um how you're managing the the loss of genetic diversity in the population you know i guess well, particularly with the captive bred population yeah okay so so just on the wild population it has been shown that it is just one large pop like there's no subspecies basically it's just one large population that's sort of inter intermingling um the reason for the male bias we 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 don't know um yeah, but but it but it, it is a proper concern, and it it is so so sad. You know, we, we get excited when we find a, a male bird calling. Oh, yeah, you know, there could be a pair, and and we find out that it's 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 him calling at no one. It is really sad. Um, so on the captive population, we so Taronga are licensed to take uh, a certain and it's a very small number. Uh, it was five birds every five years. I think at the moment it might be. Uh, four birds every four years or something, but it's a very small number. And, um, you know, there's this sort of, you, you get a bit nervous about a, popula a wild population that is so small taking birds from the wild. But, you know, it is, the, the, the captive population is that important. And at the moment, I'm pretty sure there's only one or maybe two wild male birds that, that are left in the captive population, all the rest of senesta or well, you know so it's mostly just and so that those are the birds that have actually got the classic call so they are really important individuals so taronga are really keen to get a couple of more what we call founder males to add to the population not just for the genetics but also to to help the young birds um learn the proper song because often the zebra birds are coming out and they're not doing the the, the proper calls either um Regents just have this ability to, they're very elastic in their calls. We, we don't know why. They are the only, the, the only honey eater that has the ability to do other bird calls. We, we have no idea why that is, but um, yeah, it's, it's now becoming a bit of a problem. Um, a question from Gary Fry, another Gary, on um, noisy miners and was asking the question whether you've looked at work coming out of David Lindemeyer's lab about using vegetation structure as a way of discouraging noisy miners. Absolutely. So uh, I guess with the Regent Honey Eater, because, you know, I guess they haven't got a lot of time. So removing miners from, from a site has immediate benefit. Um, discouraging them from coming back does take time, but that is, that is, that is definitely a strategy that um, we're looking at, particularly in places where we actually remove the birds from. I mean, there's almost no point just removing birds in an environment, particularly like the Cape Eden Valley, which, which is just, you know, it must be tens of thousands of noisy miners. They will just return back to the site. So we do need to discourage the miners from coming back. So, so yes, we, we are definitely, um, we, I don't, don't know if we've actually uh, implemented it yet, but it is certainly something that we, we intend on doing, yeah. Okay. Um, question from Julia, whether they feed on bottle brush? Yeah, so I, I did briefly show a photo of a, of a wild male bird there in the Tamalpan woodlands. Uh, 
funnily enough, that's a, a, a nationally threatened, um, it's Callistum and Linaro Foley. So it's an endangered bottle brush that a critically endangered bird was, was feeding on. So yeah, they, um, they do. And in 2018, I actually watched a young female that was a parent bird. I watched her feeding on a bottle brush blossom and actually going back and provisioning a chick with, with the blossom. That was quite amazing. So yeah, whereas we do, we do talk about gum trees being the most important, uh, bottle, I would definitely put bottle brushes as probably the second most important. Whether or not that's just a, a, a chance thing that, you know, while they're feeding on the spotted gums or the iron barks and they, oh, they look down and they see a bottle brush and they think, oh, well, we might as well have a crack. I, you know, I don't know if they would actually travel across landscapes seeking out bottle brushes, but they, they certainly, yeah, do feed on it. Okay. A uh, question from Ricky about whether they breed just once a year or can they actually do a second clutch in a good year? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, we know for a fact that uh, um, in Tamalpin, again, uh, they, in 2007, there was, we know that they had, they, they did double clutches there. We had evidence of one pair uh, double clutching last year. And in fact, in 2007, it's possible that, they, that a pair could have gone three times. Uh, and yeah, obviously this 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 used to happen as well in in, in the Cape and, in, and elsewhere. So yes, when conditions are, are good, um, they they would certainly make make the most of it. Uh, I guess it's really you know like it's just one of those things. Uh, whether or not they're successful with either clutch, it just comes down to so many so many factors. And and they will they will start shaping to breed early on uh you know i've actually seen like i mentioned before that there are some pairs in the lower hunter at the moment and they are very much behaving like pairs like they they, they have nesting on their mind so regent honey eaters will actually start building nests as, as early as late july early august and will um will breed as late as january so yeah so definitely you know, in that five month period, they can definitely have it have, have a go at least at least twice. Okay. And uh, final question from Keith about whether those birds that have been sighted in southeast Queensland, whether mm. they've come from the Kapiti or elsewhere, or or are they actually habitats that need to be protected in Queensland? Uh, great. I love it when people ask about Queensland because I, I'm actually. I'm quite passionate about about that part of their range because nobody looks there. It's a there's a it's almost the sleeping giant, I think, for for regents. And in recent years, we've had first year birds arrive in places like Tin Can Bay, which is a long way north. And I I, I just wouldn't have thought that a bird that hatched in the Capity Valley or the Upper Hunter has made it all the way to the Sunshine Coast or, or even north in the, yeah. So I, I do believe that Regent honey eaters are still breeding in Queensland. Uh, it's just that we we don't really, you know, we, we monitor places like Jurakai State Forest. That's sort of the, the main the main area that we monitor, the Ma McIntyre River, that that region. Uh, but I'm I'm convinced that <laughs> there are birds elsewhere. It's um, Whereas we're, we're quite, we, we get a lot of bird watchers sort of mobilised in Victoria and New South Wales, we haven't really been able to, to crack the Queensland market um, in getting a lot of, a lot of bird watchers out, out looking for them in that part of their range. But yeah, I, I actually think there's more birds in Queensland than there are in Victoria. Well, following th through from that then, uh, were they historically recorded in the Pelliga and more broadly across the Brigalow Belt? Yeah, not... Yeah, they, they were, um, but they they've always really been a specialist of 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 the slopes. So okay. I guess yeah, they're, they're occupying those valleys on the western slopes and also the the drier coastal valleys. Once you got onto the sort of more flatter country of the Pilliga, yeah, you, you start to get you know the the country's dominated by sort of bimble box starts to kick in and you get colitis and stuff like that. Um, but having said that, you know the the, the birds definitely occurred in the Pilliga and, and there was a pair of birds um, found within the last last 10 years. Uh, I guess the Pilliga again is similar to Queensland. Like it's, a, it's a big place and we don't get like absolute coverage uh, of, of, that, of that area. Okay. So, you know, I guess that's, that's where my optimism stems from is the fact that, yeah, there's still a lot of habitat that, does, that goes unsearched and then, um, yeah, it's just hard to argue with some of that data that we get um, that, yeah, this, 
this bird is you know, legitimately very rare. Thanks, Mick. Well, look, we've just rolled over the seven o'clock mark. Um, I'd just like to thank you once again for your presentation tonight. I, I, I actually think it's um, one of the most informative we've ever had, and it's been incredibly fascinating, incredibly confronting, <laughs> uh, but, you know, great to know that there's such good work and well-directed science-based work going into the protection of this species. And um, Thank you to you and thank you to everybody who's attended tonight. We, we really appreciate you spending this time with us. Thanks all. Thanks for the opportunity.